Hey guys, so, uh, and girls, and Z's, hey people, maybe I should say hey people. It is funny, like, in this modern world, like, there are all these words that you were just used to saying, and then you don't really think about them. They're just some one of those things that are so entirely ingrained, and then you do start thinking about them, and you're like, huh, is that the proper word to use? So when I say hey guys... Does that mean girls aren't invited? Does that mean Z's are not invited? Whenever I say Z, that means transgender. I'm probably even screwing up that word realistically. I don't know. Maybe I should say, hey, people. I don't know. Random things to think about in this modern world. This modern world. But anyways, what the hell. Oh, this is just where my, my mind goes when I'm not, when I don't have focus. Anyways, so what is this? This is April 5th. This is Tuesday, April 5th, and as you can see, it looks like a nice, beautiful day, and as you can see, I'm wearing my hat and my gloves, because it's fucking cold again. Like, seriously, guys, what the hell? This is just absolutely stupid. So I've been talking about how the how the weather in Maryland goes up and down, and so yeah, now the high today was like 43 or maybe it was like 45. So like a couple of days ago, like a little while ago, I was getting a sunburn and then it gets cold and then it gets warm and now it's cold again. And like, it's so bad. Like literally, like like last week or something, one of these weeks, like I was worried about getting a sunburn. It was so warm. Um, and now they're gonna say by, by, uh, by Saturday, we may actually get a snowstorm. But anyways, anyways, we'll be going to Bangkok soon, so so the weather won't matter. Um, but yeah, so the weather's been going up and down and right now. It's very nice and sunny. It's very beautiful. But it is cold again. It is cold again. As far as a geek diet from front goes, oh my golly, what the hell? The only thing worse than the weather around here apparently seems to be my diet. I have absolutely no idea why. I have absolutely no idea why. I got on the scale this morning and I was up to the 204 range. Um, which would make sense if I went out and ate a bacon double cheeseburger or something. But like, I haven't. I've actually been eating like continuously vegan. Um, I'm not even sure when the last time I had some, some meat was, to be honest with you. But I've been eating plant, well obviously plant based if it's vegan. <laughs> I'm not sure if you could non-plant-based vegan. Actually, there's a lot of weird food out there. Like, vegans, like, there's this idea that vegans are healthy. <laughs> That's a bunch of horse shit right there. <laughs> Some of the crap that vegans eat, oh my golly, when you want to talk about a chemistry experiment, look at some of the stuff that vegans eat. So actually, you could probably be a non-plant-based vegan. You could probably actually do that. <laughs> You're just sitting there eating your little chemistry experiment. I'm sure there are some non, uh, some non-plant-based vegans out there. But anyways, yeah, I've been eating the whole vegan thing, and, um, and again, like not overeating or any of that kind of stuff. So I have no idea. I stepped on the scale this morning and hit the 204 mark. The only thing that I was thinking is my wife did bring up the other day when I lost the weight so quickly on the uh, on the banana cleanse deal is that since there was no salt, zero salt, uh, added salt in that diet, obviously, um, that maybe I had I had lost water weight. And so maybe by eating salt, um, I just gained water weight back very quickly. Um, I don't know. I honestly have no idea because I'm still, like I say, I, 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 I thought I was eating properly. I think I'm eating properly, going out there, exercising, busting my ass. But yeah, oh, you want to talk about sad. You want to talk about sad. A few days ago, I was at 197. And then I get on the scale this morning at 204. But oh well. Again, that's why one of the reasons why I, 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 I talk about this with you guys, to show the ups and the downs, and hopefully at some point there will be the downs. <laughs> hopefully at some point I'll be hitting that, that 190 mark at some point. But uh, going out there, exercising, doing all that kind of stuff, so who knows. Um, I have started eating more bananas again today. Um, I'm not going to do the banana cleanse. I'm not focusing on the banana cleanse. Um, but when I stopped eating bananas, we had like a case of bananas left. And then my wife stopped eating bananas, so we had two cases of bananas left. And so I keep going into the, the, the kitchen, and there's like, I don't know, 150 bananas sitting there. So, um, I actually, I'm not intolerant to bananas. It's not that I dislike bananas. Um, I just didn't particularly like the cleanse. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to start eating a lot of bananas and then adding stuff in. Uh, so, uh, so today, like, I had 10 bananas for lunch with strawberries.
And I think tonight I'll have like 10 bananas for dinner with cherries. And who knows, maybe that'll make it better for me, you know, if I have that, that additional little food in there. Again, I'm not trying to do the cleanse. Like if I start feeling crappy, um, I'll eat normal food again. Uh, but again, you know, it is. When you sit there and you're looking at like $50 of bananas that are basically rotting, and you're like, you know what? I did buy all these bananas. Maybe at least I should eat them. So we'll see with that. So I will be eating more bananas. We'll see how it goes. Maybe that's it. Maybe if you're going to do the banana cleanse, you just need to throw in some blueberries. Maybe that, that'll, that'll settle everything out. I don't know. As far as exercise and all that goes, just been trucking along, trucking along again. Uh, did, the, did the spinning class this morning. Very nice. Again, I talked to you guys about like patterns and stuff. Like when you get into patterns and things that you start to miss. Like things that you used to have to drag yourself out of bed for in the past and then you start to miss. So I haven't done spinning since uh, last Thursday, right? So it's Tuesday now. So like four or five days I haven't done spinning because I missed it because I was feeling so crappy on the, the banana cleanse. And so I was actually really excited to get back in there. I was in there sweating away doing the spinning class and it felt very good this morning. So I'm very happy with that. I also went out and did my little strength training this afternoon. Uh, and I keep, like I say, I chart everything out. And so I know a lot of people say, don't do strength training every day. Uh, but every single day, you know, my, my marks keep going up. So, uh, so I think today I had like six of the exercises that I do um, were improvements over yesterday. So I'll keep going along. Again, as I say, <laughs> as I say, everybody's like, that is not the best way to do it. It's like, yeah, but it's the way that I am going to do it. Right? <laughs> you know, Chris Rock, Chris Rock really cares about his body. So I'm sure he'll go out there and he'll do it the absolute best way. Like, uh, like the guy who plays Wolverine. Who is it? Um, what's his name that plays Wolverine? Uh, but anyways, I was watching him one day, and he was talking about like the whole exercise he, routine he does to get the exact type of muscles. And he eats like 20 chicken breasts a day and all that kind of stuff. And he has like the best personal trainer in the world. And here's the thing. I'm a Hugh Jackman. I'm not trying to be Hugh Jackman. <laughs> I'm just trying to get in better shape. <laughs> so you know what? If I'm not doing it the best... That's okay, as long as it's good enough. And as I can see, like I say, at least my body, like I say, for strength and all that, uh, I'm doing well. Because like I say, when I started all this, um, simply doing things every other day was painful. And now I'm going to the gym twice a day. And I feel good for it, too. So anyways. So the big thing today, though, the big thing, the big thing, the big thing uh, that I'm very happy about is we got our airline tickets. So yes, we officially got our airline tickets to Bangkok. Uh, we're going to Thailand for a month. I'm very happy at the end of April through May. So I'm very excited about that. We decided to, to cut it off at the 30-day mark. Uh, my wife has to be back for something anyway. Um, and Thailand has this weird thing where if you fly in, you automatically get a 30-day visa. Um, but then to get more than a 30-day visa, it turns into a real pain in the ass. So if you want to stay 60 days, um, it's worth it to go through the whole... Uh, like the real visa process. So that's the thing. It's like when you go into Thailand, um, don't quote me on this, but if you come over land, so basically you come in through a bus. Let's say you're coming from Cambodia and coming through a bus. Uh, you get a 15-day visa. That can be extended if you go through the process. If you fly in, you get a 30-day visa that can be extended. Um, but if you actually get a visa before you leave, um, you can actually get a 60-day Right. Uh, so basically looking at it, uh, what, we, what we saw is that if we wanted to go there like maybe later in the fall and we wanted to go for 60 days, it is well worth going through the process to get the visa. Because you got to pay money, you got to ship things around, you got to get photographs, blasey, 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 blasey. Um, the thing is, is if you just want to stay 34 days versus 30 days, uh, the return on investment isn't that high. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like you sit there and you look at it and you're like, you know what? Um, it's kind of going to be a pain in the ass to, uh, to go through all this hoopla, basically just to say an extra couple of days. Uh, so we decided to cut it off right at that, that 30 day mark, which will be more than enough. We're going to go up, like I said, we're going to go to Bangkok, we're going to go into Thailand, we're going to go to Bangkok, we're going to go up to Chiang Mai, going to go down to, I think the Krabby area. Um, I didn't get to Krabby before, before I got beat half to death. Um, uh, so I really want to go to Krabby because Krabby in Thailand is supposed to be a really great place, especially for backpackers, because you got this really nice, flat, beautiful beach apparently, uh, and then you have the, these these limestone mountains, basically like cliffs, 
well, basically really massive boulders, like fucking like huge, essentially like just chunks of rock, just absolutely gorgeous. Um, but that's apparently is where all the rock climbing is done. Uh, and so I talked with people before that went to Krabby and that's a thing is you sit out, you get a tan, you're reading your book. Somebody walks up and goes, Hey man, you want to belay me? Sure. I'll belay you. You go over, do a couple hours of rock climbing, go back do a little swim in the water. That sounds really nice. I wanted to get to Krabby before, so uh, so maybe we'll get to Krabby or we'll get somewhere down there. And I think overall for a month it'll be a good thing. And the only thing that sucks, especially being from the U.S., is that, that flying to Thailand is just a bugger. No way to get around that. Uh, so we got our flights uh, today. We bought our flights on Qatar Airlines uh, today. And flying there will be like 23 three hours and 50 minutes total uh, and then flying back will be like 24 hours 50 minutes total um, and realistically that's about the best you're gonna get because um, you know shockingly <laughs> there are no direct flights from BWI to uh, to Bangkok um, and even if you're on one plane it's just so far it's literally halfway around the world so even if you're on one plane uh, the problem is and I've had this before when you go to Asia is you still stop somewhere so even if you take like British Airways, and you're say on one plane, you'll fly to London. At London, they'll re regas up, change out the crew, do all that kind of stuff, and fly. And so, although you're on one plane, you're still on the ground for like two hours. Um, so, what I like with the, the the flights that we got is we're gonna fly from Baltimore to Doha in Qatar. Uh, be there for about three hours, three through three, three and a half hours, which is pretty, like I said, that's about normal wherever you're going to stop somewhere uh, and then fly directly to Bangkok. Uh, so that should be a good thing. Uh, one of the lessons in life for business, though, and this was a very good lesson in life for business and for pissing off uh, potential customers over nickel and diming things. So the reason that we decided to take Qatar Airlines, because some of you guys might be like, Qatar Airlines, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Is that really an airline? Is that an airline or an after-school special? Right? Uh, but basically what we were looking at is to go all the way to Asia. Um, the first thing that, that we did was look at the normal um, you know, budget travel stuff. So Travelocity, Orbits, that kind of thing. Uh, the issue that you run into when you do Travelocity, Orbits, and that kind of thing is that the way that they combine flights, again, since there's no direct flight, there's zero direct flight. So they do all this flight combining crap. And when they do the flight combining crap, the problem is, is they take you through multiple airlines. Um, and that can be a real pain in the butt. Um, and not only is it a real pain in the butt, uh, but it's a real, like most of the flights are really long. So like north of 30 hours. And so you got these weird things like you might be able to get a flight there in 24 hours, but the return flight will be like 35 hours. And you just get all this weird crap because again, they're trying to give you theoretically, theoretically the best price possible. So we're looking at that and you know, after a while of just you know, going through this flight and this flight and this flight being a complete pain in the ass, is like screw this. You know what? Uh, instead of going through one of these 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 budget sites, let's just go to a real airline and buy tickets from a real airline. And going through and looking at American and looking at uh, Lufthansa and looking at Thai. Holy crap! Thai Airlines is now expensive. Thai Airlines. I give it a thumbs up. At least the last time I flew them, I give them a thumbs up. But holy crap! It was like thirty five hundred dollars per seat for economy. I was like. Uh, right, $7,000 round trip. I was like, yeah, it's a little expensive. So we're looking around, and so I finally figure out um, British Airways. So it's like, I like British Airways. British Airways is very comfortable, treated me well. And again, especially when you're dealing with long flights, you don't want to be in a cattle car. Oh my God. Oh, when I went to India, oh, I learned my lesson. Is it Indian Airlines? Indian Air? I don't know what the hell that thing is. That is a cattle car in the skies. It was so bad. Indian Air, I, I don't want to say the wrong name. It was either Indian Air, Indian Air. It was like the premier carrier for India, which was so fucking sad. Because it really, it was so bad that literally the flight attendants had this little old lady crying at a certain point during the flight. Because it was one of these things, like, right, because Indians have very big families. And so a lot of a lot of times what happens is Indians that come to the U.S., they'll go back to India for like a month or two at a time. And this is just kind of one of those things that they normally do. Um, and so you take the entire family with you. It's kind of like, you know, Americans go to Disney World, they go back to Mumbai. Eh, makes sense, right? Uh, well, the thing is, is when they're going through and they're buying all their tickets, 
Um, a lot of times, if you're getting if you're getting five people to fly somewhere, you can't get the tickets all together. So what would happen is is the families would come on board the airplane, and then they'd say, "Hey, we're a family. Can we sit together?" And then people would be nice, and they say, "Sure." And people would swap so that the family could sit together, and everybody was happy. Everybody was happy, except for the Indian stewardesses. Oh my golly, they lost their mind. You want to talk about a product of bureaucracy? You want to talk about it? They lost their minds. They're like, you will sit in your assigned seat. So they're moving everybody around. And there's this little old lady, this little old lady, I'm horrible laugh about this little old Indian lady that keeps getting moved from seat to seat to seat. And she doesn't give a shit where she sits. She's just like, I'm a little old Indian lady. <laughs> I just want to sit. And they, like I say, the stewardesses move her from seat to seat. She goes through like five seats, and then she's in this seat. The stewardess comes up to her, is like, you're in the wrong seat. Oh, it was pathetic. This little old Indian lady starts just bawling. Just starts bawling on this plane. I've been moved five seats. I don't care where I sit. I just want to be able to sit down. You've moved me five times. You're just like, oh my golly. <laughs> this is before we even took off, and you're just like, wow. Wow. And uh, yeah, it didn't really get a whole lot better than that uh, during the flight. Uh, and whatever it was, was it Indian Air? It was one of those. It was absolutely god awful. It really was. That was just. That was just putting your best foot forward, India, let me tell you. But anyways, that was really crappy. But, like, like Thai Airways was, like, amazing. Thai Airways was amazing. But that's one of the things. And so, like, when you're going to do these long-haul flights, um, you, you don't want little old ladies, like, <laughs> breaking down in tears, right, before you even take off. That's just, that's just doesn't make you feel any better. So we are looking at all these different things. And Thai, thai air, Airlines or whatever was too expensive this time. Um, and so I looked for British Airways. It was like, okay, let's, let's just do British Airways. British Airways had a pretty decent uh, flight. Uh, it was from here to, uh, to Heathrow, from Heathrow to Bangkok. But then they had like a weird flight back. So it was like 24 hours there, which is about the norm. Um, and then, but the flight back was Bangkok to Tokyo on a different carrier, and then Tokyo to Heathrow, uh, and then Heathrow back to Baltimore, which obviously adds. And so that added like seven hours to the trip. But you know, trying to figure all this out, and my wife wants, wants a particular time, she wants to come during the day and not during the night, and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, you know what, screw it. I looked there, you know, the tickets were gonna be, you know, the total of the tickets came to like 50, 56, 57 hundred dollars, but it's like, you know what, once we get to Thailand, Thailand is dirt cheap. Just brutally dirt cheap. Beautiful place, dirt cheap. Um, so it's like, you know what, I'll just spend the extra money on the tickets. Um, you know, we'll, we'll know exactly what our thing is. We know we're with a good company. Again, British Airways is a good company. We, we know it'll all be good. Right, and literally, so I'm going through, I've already bid in the bullet. I've already decided I'm going to spend $5,700. $5, and then I'm trying to figure out how to, um, how to get assigned seats. And then I'm going through the process, and then it tells, you know, I, I get all the way through, I give them all the information. And then at the end of the thing, right before they take your credit card, it then tells me that I have to pay $53 per leg, per person, for an assigned seat. So from here, from BWI to Heathrow, would cost $106 simply for the assigned seat. From Heathrow to Bangkok would be another $106. From Bangkok to Tokyo would be another $106. From Tokyo to Heathrow, so it would end up being like another $530 just simply for an assigned seat. At which point I was just like, go to hell, British Airways. And so I started looking around um, a little more, and that's where I come up across Qatar Airlines, where all told, all told, it's $1,800. Sub $1,800 is like $1,753. I always try to get a little conservative with numbers with you because I don't want you to make you give you the wrong number. But yeah, it's sub $1,800 for two tickets round trip. Not only is it round trip, but the flights make a hell of a lot more sense. They're better times, so we actually fly out. We fly out at like 9 or 10 at night from here, which will be nice, because if you're on a 12-hour flight, 
hey, wouldn't it be great to be flying during the night when you're going to sleep anyway? Right? Uh, and then you get in. It's a little stop. So get a nice little breakfast. Right? So 12 hours, you kind of get a nice little breakfast, get a little star Starbucks in Doha, then fly. That'll be a good thing. Um, and then coming back, it's basically the same deal. Um, the only thing that sucks, actually, is going back. We have to leave at 2 o'clock in the morning. But then it gets us in at a nice time. So overall, you know, the, the, everything, you know, works out better. It is, it is, it's faster flights, all of that kind of stuff. And it is like a fraction of the cost. It's like a third of the cost of British Airways. And so again, this is one of those lessons in life about like trying to nickel and dime people to hell and back. Because it was. I, was. I had already been in the ball. I was already going through the process to spend 57 fucking hundred dollars to buy airline tickets with British Airlines. All the way up until they want $500 simply for assigned seats. What the hell? What is wrong with British Airways? What is wrong with any of these airlines anymore? Now, I know some of you guys are going to be thinking, oh, Eli, but it's Qatar. Qatar Airlines. Qatar Airlines, Eli. Oh, what the hell are they going to be? You're going to be in that airplane, and it's going to be duct taped together with all those Muslims? What the hell are you thinking? You're going to Doha. Uh, but one of the things that I have found uh, with traveling in the real world, the traveling with the real world, is a lot of times going with airlines, uh, especially like these national type carriers, um, in countries that, that I don't really want to say Qatar is up and coming, but these countries that really kind of want to impress the world, is that you actually get a phenomenal level of service. You get a phenomenal quality for a really nice price. So, uh, so with Qatar Airlines, it's actually a rel relatively uh, new airline, I guess. Um, they've got really new planes. So again, like when you're thinking about safety and all that kind of stuff, because you're oh Qatar Airlines, right? Well, here's the deal. Um, they've got new aircraft. Right. So again, if you're thinking about the U.S. aircraft, I mean, I mean, that's one of the sad things. Like I used to like to fly American or United. There was a time when I would pay more money to fly American or United. I hated Southwest. I hated Southwest with a passion. I would not fly a piece of crap Southwest plane, right? Because I was going to fly American United. Again, American and United used to be very good companies. You got an American or United plane, you're like, wow. This is an airplane, right? Well, unfortunately, with all the, the budget battles and all the, the bankruptcies and all that kind of stuff, most of the, the airlines that used to be really good are actually pretty damn crappy anymore. So these brand names that you know, like United or American or Delta, a lot of the times you're getting on an airplane that's literally damn near older than I am. You know what I'm saying? They're older than me. The, the, the stewardess or the attendants don't really care anymore. And it's not just really very good experience. So although you're like, hey, that's an American carrier, it's like, yeah, it's an American carrier <coughs> with a with a jalopy, <laughs> a jalopy, right? And so something to think about with the, these uh, these national carriers of, of smaller countries you may not think about is that they're flying. Um, uh, they're flying newer aircraft, so these are actually new aircraft because they're, they're rather young fleets. Um, and then what you have to realize, especially if you're doing international travel, is that most of the, basically for international travel, especially if you're coming to the U.S., uh, you have to have pilots of a certain standard. So that they're basically, in order to fly into the U.S., they all have to have the, the, the standard. They all speak English. They, all, they go through the Boeing training. They all go through all this kind of stuff. So realistically, the, the, the pilot that you get uh, flying you trans, uh, across, across the ocean is going to be as good or maybe possibly even better than the, than the, the pilot that's flying you within the country. Uh, now, that does get quirky. Just so you know, um, I, I absolutely and utterly trust almost any pilot for international travel. Again, because they have to be up to certain standards in order to be able to do things like fly into the United States. Um, but do realize, like, <laughs> internal flights... <laughs> not the same standard. I actually believe that for, for the United States, too. Um, I had a buddy of mine who was a commuter, uh, commuter like a shuttle um, pilot. Um, and yeah, <laughs> there are some scary stories. There are some stories I'm just not going to tell you because they're just not going to make you feel any better. Uh, but that's the thing. So like these smaller aircraft, like here in the U.S., which is really weird, is smaller aircraft are, and I was told this by the pilot, smaller aircraft with shorter flights are more difficult to fly than bigger aircraft with longer flights. But here's a screwed up thing. <laughs> New pilots 
are, are hired to fly the shuttle flights that are actually more difficult than the big airplane flights um, until they get enough experience to fly the big airplanes. So the airplanes that are actually from a pilot standpoint, more difficult to fly are the ones being flown by the least experienced pilots. And that's here in the U.S. We're not talking about Africa. We're not talking about Thailand. We're talking about here in the U.S. Um, so that's why I feel okay, by and large, with the, the international stuff. Because they're doing the... Um, they have new planes. They have good training. They're trying to put their best foot forward uh, the whole nine yards. And then what I like with flying them, too, is, again, you just get a very, very good quality. So a lot of times you get, like, bigger seats. You get more leg room. Because they're trying to show the world how cool they are. Right? It's like anybody else, you know, right? You know, it's all about ego. We are cool. Um, and so one of the things is, like, with a lot of countries out there, that they, they feel like they kind of get looked down on by, like, the Western world. The Western world is like, ha, 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 we are so impressive and so cool, and you are, right? Um, and so that's why a lot of these countries are, are trying to put their best foot forward and say, no, look, we're, we're not. We're, we're less developed than you. We're not, like, primitive assholes. <laughs> and so one of the ways that they can do that is by creating good air, really good high quality airlines that show the world that, that they're doing good stuff. Um, and the other thing too is like with the Middle Eastern Airlines is because some people are like, well, it's Middle Eastern Airlines. But um, unless, at least for the Emirates and Doha and all that kind of stuff, they're actually trying to make those, those areas more of a hub for the world. So if you look at hubs, uh, like Heathrow is a hub massive hub so many like transcontinental flights and all that go to Heathrow and so again you know the middle middle eastern people aren't fucking stupid you know they they know that oil is going to dry up at some point and so they're looking for new industries and they're looking for for ways to to keep their country successful uh once that boom has gone away and so one of the one of the things that they're doing is like i say with these airlines is by trying to make themselves more of a central hub that will keep business in coming in for for you know another generation and realistically when you think about it uh, it's not a bad place to have a hub so, I mean, if you have flights coming in, you can have flights coming in from the United States, you can have flights coming in from Europe, you can have flights coming in from Asia, you can have flights coming in from Africa. Realistically, if you're going to put a hub somewhere, Heathrow isn't the best place to put a hub. I mean, just, just to be honest about it, right? If you were going to, like, look at a map of the planet, and you are going to say, this is where I'm going to put a hub for an airport, um, Heathrow... I would not think would actually be the top of the list. It's one of those places that, because it is a hub, it is continuing to be a hub. But if you had to kind of like whiteboard it and do it all over again, realistically, someplace in the Middle East would actually be a, be a better bet, I would argue. Um, so that's why I'm not too worried about like the whole thing taking Qatar Airlines is again like I say it's a national carrier it's got to be good quality all of that kind of stuff and again they, they do things like keep the price down because they want people uh, to actually fly their planes again because like like with the UK with 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 Britain British Airways they don't care they they already know they're cool they are like look we are British Airways we will make you pay five hundred dollars for an assigned seat just because we can <laughs> all right. Uh, whereas, like I say, some of these other countries, like with Thailand or with with uh, with Qatar or the United the, the Emirates airlines and all that, they're they're trying to put their best foot forward. So they're like, hey, you know what? We're not going to screw around with you on stupid things on things that anybody in the world knows is stupid, like charging that much for simply an assigned seat after you've already bought the tickets for an assigned seat is ridiculous. It's insulting. It's stupid. It says basically, you know what? We do not care if you fly our planes, right? Bend over. Um, and so they're not trying to do that because they're trying to say, hey, look, look at how cool we are. So I'm not, not that worried about it. Um, and again, the thing too is like we fly to Doha. And if you want to see like, I mean, brand new sparkling cities, uh, take a look at the pictures of Doha. That is definitely a brand new sparkling city. A very beautiful place. Very beautiful place. But, uh, but yeah, so, uh, so we, are, we are getting everything prepared to go to Thailand. Very excited about that. Uh, it'll be nice and warm. Should be in the 90s while we're there. 90s to 100. Uh, so that'll be a very good thing. It's very, very, very warm in Thailand. Very hot in Thailand. 
Thailand. Be very good. Um, and so now I guess we have to start planning what we will actually do. I'm not a big planner. I'm not a big planner on any of these trips. I kind of figure, you know, go where the wind blows. Um, the nice part with going to Asia is one of the things that you find uh, backpacking or traveling is the poorer the country you're in, uh, the easier, the fundamental easier it is to travel. All right? So if you try to come to the United States, backpacking in the United States sucks. Su basically, don't do it. Basically, like, uh, don't do it, right? Backpacking in the United States sucks. Our mass transit systems suck. We have very few things like hostels. Hostels are like a freaking novelty. Like, ooh, a hostel, right? Trying to get around, trying to get yourself fed. Again, trying to find inexpensive food. Like, just trying to, like go to a restaurant or go to a diner and get inexpensive food. It's like brutally expensive, right? Um, you go to Europe, Europe, you know, it doesn't well, do as well as the United States in a lot of ways. But you go there, it's a lot easier. They got, they got great mass transit. It's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you a lot of money. Again, your rail passes aren't cheap, um, but they exist, right? So you can go there, you get the Eurorail pass. There's hostels everywhere. Hostels are absolutely great. Uh, you, can, you can feed yourself relatively inexpensively. Um, so again, you go to Europe. Um, it's, it's, it's a good, again, doing the whole backpack of circuit there. It's great. But then you go to places like India or you go to places like Thailand, and then it is just like balls out simple. It's so simple because, again, everybody there, you know, that's a thing is like... If people don't own vehicles, then you have to have a mass transport system in order to move your own population around, right? Your own population, like if you go to Thailand, the Thai people have to get from point A to point B. So if they don't own cars, they got to do that somehow. So they have a great mass transit system. So there's no like special tourist mass transit system. You just get on the buses and the trains and the planes or whatever else that everybody else is using. Again, people there don't have a lot of money, so you go to the cafe, and you can buy food. Again, 50 cents, and you get a whole meal. You know, oh, no. Oh, no, they're going to screw you over. Oh, you're a farang. Oh, you're a foreigner. Oh, we're going to double the price. We're going to charge you 75 cents for that whole meal. I see so many travelers that get so pissed with that. I can't believe they overcharged me. It's like, dude, they overcharge you like literally a dime. Like, literally, the amount of money that they overcharge you could fall out of my pocket, and I wouldn't even notice. And yet, you're, you're losing your mind because they overcharge you because you're a foreigner. But that's the thing, is you go there, and it's just so, like I said, it's just so inexpensive. But that's what's nice. And so, for hotel rooms, for travel, all that kind of thing, um, it's just really, 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 really easy. The other thing I like about Thailand, too, is... Um, I'll leave it to somebody else to say whether, how, how well their development plans are working. But like when I was there, one of the problems was that they were trying to develop economically. And, and so, so much of their, 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 their economy is based around tourism. So what the government decided to do, and the wisdom of all governments, they said, well, if the money is in tourism, what we should do is build more hotels. And so, like, when I was in Thailand before, that was a thing. It's like all the travelers would figure out where the other travelers were staying because the worst thing in the world or the creepiest thing in the world was staying in an empty hotel. Like, literally, they had just these hotels and guest houses, just these big hotels and guest houses. And if you didn't stay in a place where everybody else was staying, you would check in and you would be, like, the only person. Like, literally, you're paying, like, $5 a night to stay in this place, and you are the only person. You walk down the halls, and it's just, like, echoing. Cuck, 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 cuck. And you're like, oh, this is creepy. Um, but the good point with that is uh, you don't generally run into the whole problem. Like, even in Europe, where uh, hostels or hotel rooms uh, fill up, and then you end up, you know, sleeping in the train station. There's almost always some place there. Again, bot, $5 in bot solves a lot of problems. And again, that's one nice thing, too, with, uh, with going to, like, third world countries is, I mean, my, my wife cringes when I say this type of thing, but it's just true, so she can deal with it, is it's like 50 U.S. dollars solves almost any problem in Thailand. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you need a place to stay, you pull out. 20 bucks, you pull out 30 US dollars, you got a place to stay. You need to get, a, you need to get from point A to point B. Again, you pull out 50 bucks, you will get from point A to point B. Almost any problem that you could have in Thailand for 50 US dollars can get solved, right? Um, and the reason is, is because these people still know what the hell money is about. Because uh, that's the thing, is you come to the United States and um, 
you know, you're dealing with employees, you're dealing with people, and everybody here is, is already comfortable. They're not, they're not worried. Like, if they don't get their paycheck, they're kind of concerned about it, but they're not really worried. They're not scared about it. Uh, whereas you go to a lot of these countries, and that's the thing, is, is the money that they bring in is very valuable. It's very important. It's how they're going to feed their kids, right? So if you pull out 50 bucks, they're going to work their ass off for that $50. They're going to be like, holy shit, that's 50 bucks. I want that 50 bucks. <laughs> Let me do what's required to get that 50 bucks out of you, right? Um, and so, again, that's one, that's one nice thing. It sounds crass as hell, but, again, that's just how it is, right? You know, these, this is a place where people actually really care about things like money because they still understand what the value of it is. Um, and so traveling through there, it's good. And so that, that's why I don't have much of a plan um, because, again, I know, like, 10 or 20 U.S. dollars basically solves any problem. It's like, oh, no. The ten dollar a night guest house that I wanted to stay at is all booked up. Crap! I guess I'm gonna have to go to this hotel. It's gonna cost me twenty five dollars a night. Damn you! Right. It'll be a hell of a lot better hotel than I, I would stay in here in the United States for one hundred fifty dollars a night. But you know, but that's the big thing. Like, uh, like if you go, if you do go travel through like any of these countries or whatever, you just have that extra money in your back pocket. You know, again, like I say, you just have to have that cushion. If you're gonna go, if you're gonna go travel, you're gonna go backpack. You should have a cushion, not necessarily a huge cushion, but again, you have, you have like five hundred U.S. dollars in your back pocket for for happenstance, right? If you don't need it during the trip, great. Um, spend it on buying beer when you get back home. But if you need it on the trip, just pull it out and use it. And again, like $500 total, that'll get you almost anything. That'll get you a flight places. That'll get, you know, random things happen. Uh, but the other thing, too, is like when you're traveling, um, even if you spend an extra $25 here that you didn't expect for a hotel room, what you can do is you go down to Krabby or you go down to one of these other places and you'll find, you know, guest houses that'll cost you, you know, again, like I say $5 a night or even less. Um, so like when I traveled before, again, it really was, when I was in Thailand, it was $10 a day. That included my travel, that included my guest house, like guest houses, not hostels, guest houses, uh, guest houses, eh, basically a hotel room, really low-end hotel room, but a hotel room. Uh, so guest houses, uh, food, and beer, that's back when I was still drinking beer. And believe me, any country you go to, they all know the profit margin is in the alcohol. <laughs> you want to save money? <laughs> Don't buy so much alcohol, right? But that was with beer. That was that was going to the bars or whatever and buying as much beer as I wanted. Um, and again, while I was there, it was 15 bucks a day. So again, like I say, when you're dealing with that little money, um, having an extra couple bucks in your in your pocket to uh, to fix problems is definitely the way to go. So so yeah. So I guess that is about the spiel. It's about the spiel. How long have I been babbling for? Oh my golly, this is like a short video. I've only been babbling for about 36 minutes. I don't really think there's anything else to babble, babble about. We've got the Qatar Airlines, we've got the, the airplane plan, now we just have to figure out a few other things. Uh, the biggest problem that I have is, um, is getting enough uh, material ready uh, so that when I leave I can have everything pu uh, publishing on a schedule. Uh, so what I've decided now when we do these trips is in order to be successful or more successful on YouTube, it's important to, ha to continuously put out content. So what I used to do for YouTube is every whenever I created a piece of content, it would immediately go out. Um, I liked doing that for a long time because it was easy for me, but the problem was is then if I went out and traveled for a month, that basically means there would be a gap of a month for content. So what I'm doing now is I'm building up a good four or five week backlog of videos. Um, so I already do that with Eli Computer Guy Live channel. So that's my question and answer channel. So when I, I sit down and I do like two weeks of videos at one shot. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll sit down and do four weeks of videos at one shot and then actually just schedule it out. Uh, and then for the main Eli, the computer guy channel, uh, I publish once a week now. So I'll, I'll public, I'll create like four or five videos and then just put it on a schedule. Um, and then away you go. But again, this is a lesson in life. This is a lesson in life on how you are successful and how you are happy. And yet everybody thinks you work really, 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 really hard, right? Is by doing things like scheduling out work. 
So as far as anybody that is concerned that's watching my content, it looks that like I am working and putting out content constantly. Like, oh, look at Eli. Every week he's in there working, putting out content. Man, it might be nice to be a YouTube personality, but think about how much work they have to do. When in reality, I backlog all my work, I schedule the publishing, and when you think I'm working really hard, I'm actually sitting at the beach drinking a drinking a coffee, not drinking a cerveza anymore, drinking a coffee uh, and soaking up the sun. So it appears, hmm, it appears that I'm very diligent and working very hard, when in reality, I'm sitting on the beach for a month. And again, these are the kind of lessons you guys have to think about how, like, the real world works. Because, again, I, I see so many people with that. Like, they think, like, in order to be successful or whatever, that you just have to kill yourself. You know, the more you work, if you work 40 hours, you got to work 50 hours. you got to work 50 hours, you got to work 60 hours. you work 60 hours, you got to 70, you work 70 hours. Really, if it, really successful people, really successful people, they're the ones working 80 hours a week. Well, screw that. Those, 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 those aren't successful people. Those are people that are workaholics. Those are people that work too much. Successful people are the ones sitting on the beach or doing whatever the hell it is they actually enjoy, right? <laughs> but again, so much of our society is so vested around this whole idea. In order to be successful, you gotta work hard. You gotta work all the time. It's like, no. You have to find a very valuable niche and then you have to figure out a workflow so you can schedule you can schedule the work that needs to be done and then go and enjoy yourself you know the rest of the time you know like i said before like when i used to do uh, projects in it like when i was a consultant and that was a thing you know i get 5 or 10,000 dollars profit for a couple of days worth of work yay <laughs> a month's worth of profit in 3 days that's the way to go why do i want to work 90 hours a week screw that <laughs> You, you're telling me I can make a month's worth of profit in like three days? Then I'm going to go to the beach. <laughs> makes sense to me. But so many people are like, oh, got to work, got to work, got to work. And what is it they always say? Work smarter, not harder. But anyways, that's what I'm going to do. I say that's what I'll do with the YouTube videos. And hopefully it'll go well. And then hopefully, hopefully at some point, at some point, fail normal. I'm really, I'm looking forward to fail normal. I'm wondering, I'm wondering how far I can push this as a business. Because like I say, I'm at that $28 a month mark now. I'm making $28 a month off of fail normal. But actually, if you look at the CPMs, if I had like 200,000 subscribers watching this, that $28 a month would actually be a hell of a lot larger than $28 a month. So, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. <sighs> Well, there we go. <laughs> it's like, do I have anything else to say? Do I have anything else to say? Uh, no, I really honestly have nothing else to say. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to eat some bananas and sweet cherries. I think I'll eat bananas and sweet cherries. Um, and we will see what my weigh-in is tomorrow. I'm so sad, man. Oh, oh, golly. Sitting there on the scale. It's like, what am I going to weigh today? Boom, 204. It's like, what? What? But again, that's where I tell you guys, like, that's why I worry about with the banana cleanse and the people getting on the, um, uh, on a creating an eating disorder is again, I mean, think about that. I go on the banana cleanse. I lose four to six pounds in like three days. Yay! I get off the banana cleanse and then I weigh even more than when I started. Right. Do you see how that, that starts to go? And now I know some of you guys are like, well, motherfucker, you just said that you're going to start eating bananas again. <sighs> I'm not eating it because I'm not eating it because I have a problem. I don't have a banana problem. I'm eating the bananas. Well, actually, because I do have a banana problem because I've got like fucking 150 bananas that I really would prefer not to have to compost. But I have, a, yes, so I will, admit, I will admit, I do, in fact, have a banana problem. But my banana problem isn't an eating disorder problem. And that that's just where we're going to end for it. <laughs> we're just going to end it right there. We're just, yeah, 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 yeah. We're just going to, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I'm listening. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bye.